Hello. Hey, this is Ben Choder, live from the Wireless Health 2012 conference, academic and industry conference. Um, we're live in San Diego, actually in La Jolla, and it is beautiful out. Um, I miss New York, but I don't miss it that much. And my first guest is Dr. Jay Sanders, CEO of Global Telemedicine Group and founding board member and president of the American Telemedicine Association. Jay Thank you, and welcome to the show. How are you, sir? Thank you, and I'm very well. Thank you. So my first question, is, is, um, and I ask everyone this, what's your favorite app? It has nothing to do with anything. I just want to know, what app do you like, if, if any app? <laughs> right it now, have to be healthcare. Yeah, no, I like the app that um, takes my history when I don't feel well, iTriage. I love that, and I know a bunch of guys at Aetna right now who are like, screaming and dancing. So my first question, hey, please introduce yourself to our listeners. And tell them about your role at Global Telemedicine Group. Well, Global Telemedicine Group is uh, really sort of a small boutique um, consulting company in the telemedicine and medical informatics and medical sensor space. Great. So, so I understand you guys developed the first statewide telemedicine system, the first um, connect, connect, correct, correctional telemedicine program, the first telehome care technology, and the first telemedicine kiosk. Wow. I mean, it, it totally outdoes anything I've ever done in my life. And with such great knowledge and experience being a pioneer in your field, what advice can you give others about developing these types of remote monitoring solutions? Well, um, first of all, you need to know the only reason I got into this was by total happenstance, and that was my professor of medicine at the Massachusetts General Hospital in 1967 who told me the only way he's going to uh, avoid the traffic in Boston between his office and the hospital was to put in TV cameras and examine his patients over TV. And when he told me that and asked me what my opinion was, I thought it was the stupidest thing I had ever heard <laughs> in my life. And, but I realized, I had enough common sense to realize that he was my professor and I right. was a resident. So I told him, gee, that's a very interesting idea and I've been working on it um, ever since. Right, so, you know, just as a side, how hard was it to pull off? Right, so, so here it is. I can picture me saying to someone on my staff, here's what I want to do. It really isn't invented. It really doesn't exist. No one's really doing it. Where do you start? What was the first thing you did? Well, <laughs> it's, it's very interesting. First of all, for about um, 15 to 20 years of my doing this, um, everybody thought I was absolutely crazy. What they didn't realize was that I was also um, – very stubborn, and I was going to continue uh, to do this. So it really didn't exist, um, you know, in the healthcare delivery system for many, many years. Um, and probably um, the best advice I can give everybody is that you've got to step in a lot of potholes uh, and learn from your uh, learn from your failures. All right. So you gave the audience a little bit of a hint of where telemedicine was when you started in it. Where is it today? And what are you most excited about where it is today? Well, the most exciting part is it's gone from something that people think are a novelty to something that's going to totally revolutionize the healthcare delivery system. Um, and let, let me explain why. Um, I'd love to hear. Fundamentally, um, everybody considers the doctor's office the place to be taken care of. Well, quite candidly, what telemedicine and mobile technologies are doing, they're totally changing that concept. In fact, like every other service industry figured out years ago, like the entertainment industry, right. the banking industry, commerce, where they bring their services to the consumer, right. healthcare now has the same capacity to bring healthcare to where the consumer is rather than where the doctor is. So we can literally bring the exam room to where the patient is. But probably what's more important is that from a physiological standpoint right. in actually examining a patient, <clears throat> it's much better to examine a patient where they live and work than where the doctor right. works. Taking someone's blood pressure in their home is a much better determination of what their real blood pressure is. 
What, what do you think some of the driving forces are? I keep on hearing numbers like, you know, seven to 10,000 baby boomers are turning 65 every day. They want to mm -hmm. age in place. So is something bringing this to a head or bringing this to the forefront, is it because there's so many more people want to age in place? And does where technology is today, does it make a difference? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But I think what you're seeing in the, in the uh, populace is the fact that, gee, if these other service industries can bring me um, all the things that they do right. to my home, where I am, wherever I may be, why can't the healthcare industry do that? The biggest problem is not going to be the consumer. The biggest problem is going to be my colleagues. Right. Why? Why do you think it's a problem with the colleagues? Well, they don't I, want I, change? Really, I probably should put it in a different fashion. I probably should say my older colleagues. Okay. <clears throat> they haven't grown up in this kind of environment. The younger colleagues are all saying, how long will it take to do this? The older colleagues are saying, this will never work. I, I, I think I agree with you 100% on that. Uh, so here's a, a little twist on it. So you know, how does mobile health fit into the equation? And really, what do you think the difference between telemedicine and mHealth is? I mean, I like to say, so I come from the streaming media world, and when I got into the whole mHealth space about a year ago, I like, and I always knew about telemedicine. Telemedicine was M Health a dozen years ago. I mean, what do you feel? No, you're ab you're absolutely correct. I I have very strong views about this, and um, fundamentally, all telemedicine is is the transport of healthcare information electronically right. from one location where it exists to another location where it's needed. Okay, so whether you do that with a phone and you tell a patient, take two aspirin and I'll see you in the morning. Whether you do it in a real-time interactive video conferencing system. Whether you send a text message. Whether you do it with a, um, uh, an email. Or whether you use a smartphone. It's all the same thing. It's electronic transport of information. So I use telemedicine as a generic term. It covers e-health, right. mobile health, store and forward uh, health, whatever. I, I agree. So in your ideal world, um, what would the future of healthcare look like in regards to wireless health? What do you, what do you see 10 years from now? What, what, what's the world going to look like? Well, first of all, I should warn everybody listening to this that I'm a very bad predictor of when <laughs> things will happen. Uh, when I finished my uh, first National Science Foundation grant in yeah. 1976 and was asked by a number of reporters when I thought this was going to be part of the day-to-day -day healthcare delivery system, I said, oh, minimum five to ten years. <laughs> yeah, but what's the biggest holdup on that is the bandwidth wasn't there, right? I mean, it was, it was technology. It wasn't idea it wasn't content it was it was pure technology one hundred percent no it was a combination of uh, both technology okay. and you're absolutely correct the bandwidth wasn't there we used very cr crude types of equipment with lots of compression right. uh, algorithms the technology was not off the shelf the right. way it is today yep. I mean it cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to do it um, and it definitely the mindset <clears throat> wasn't there um, Today, the technology solution has, uh, or problem has been solved. Um, you'll soon be going into a Best Buy or a Target's, whatever, and you'll be buying these sensors uh, off the shelf. Yep. But the mindset issue is still the one lagging behind the technological revolution. I, I agree. Um, you gave the keynote this morning, um, and your title was Mars to Main Street. What did you discuss during this presentation? Because our audience wasn't able to participate in it. What did they miss? All I've heard is raves about it. I just got off a plane, so I missed it. So I'd love a little update, too. Well, sure. Um, <clears throat> since I've had so much trouble convincing my colleagues about how the healthcare delivery system has to change, I thought that I would put it in the context of a healthcare delivery problem that everybody would understand, yep. and that is how do we develop a healthcare delivery system for the astronauts who are going to Mars and are going to live on the planet? So I identified four things that we had to do when we discussed this at NASA. Number one was, obviously, we have to bring the exam room to the astronaut. Right. We, we can't bring them back yep. to Earth. <clears throat> Number two, we need to bring collective expertise right. to the bedside. I can't, what single physician could I choose who has all of the knowledge base that I would need. There is no one. So I need to bring collective wisdom 
to the bedside. The third is because of the harsh environment and the different types of conditions that we'll see on Mars, we need to continuously monitor the patient. And number four, the most critical point is that astronaut has got to be his or her own primary care physician. Those four messages need to be the healthcare delivery system on this planet. Well, you know, it's amazing. When you're saying that, if you close your eyes, don't even think about it as another planet or Mars, it's exactly what anyone wants the patients to be doing today. Absolutely. And once again, the irony of, uh, let me just pull out continuous monitoring. Uh-huh. People look at me, what do you mean? Am I going to be continuously monitored? I mean, I don't want all those devices. Well, fundamentally, uh, the devices will be your wristwatch, right. which you will be wearing, uh, or your you know, wedding band yep. with sensors in it, or they'll be circulating in terms of nanotechnology. And in the same way, <clears throat> you turn on the ignition of your car, and the car dashboard lights up, and you know everything about your car. You hardly ever look at it until a red light exactly. goes off. Well, yep. the same sort of medical dashboard will exist for every individual. Yep. It'll be totally unobtrusive, and only when a, your blood pressure goes above what it should be right. or you have an abnormal uh, cardiac beat, will you get a warning sign? See, that's exciting. Because to me, the whole thing is if you think about the whole wireless sensor world, if you could be a diabetic patient, a child, and I could put a sensor on your hip, and my, the mother or the father would get a red light before, before the kid even knew his glucose Absolutely. was off whack. Absolutely. That's amazing. Yeah. So you think the future is bright. Are you excited over the next, well, for the next I'm, five I'm years? I'm very excited. And the, the chief thing that makes me excited is talking to the younger colleagues, talking to the residents who are just coming out of medical school. When I talk to them about this, they look at me like, well, of course, that's going to happen. Uh, when I talk to my older colleagues, they look at me like I'm crazy. I, I loved having you on the show. I wish I could do longer with you. We have, we have other guests, but I truly think you're, you're a trendsetter and innovator, and it's been an honor to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you much. Have, oh, have a great rest of the conference. Thank hey, you. Hey, so I thought that was pretty amazing. Um, I think we learned a lot. I'd love to introduce you to our next guest. Our next guest, guest is Professor um, Lionel. Um, Chair of Electrical Engineering at Oxford University and Director of Oxford Institute for Biomedical Engineering. Lionel, come on on. So um, this is great. So we're live here at the conference. The conference is going on. I have some amazing guests. So they'll be walking in and out. And this is what happens when you do a live conference. (laughs) Lionel, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. So when did you fly in? I flew in yesterday, uh, Sunday. It was two days ago, yes. How was the weather in, in London when you left? Well, if I, I've, I spent a bit of time in the Bay Area okay. meeting some of these wireless sensor companies, so I'll actually be in the U.S. for a week. And it was so, but but the, the weather wasn't too bad. We had a bit of what I call an Indian summer in the U.K. when, when the temperature rises above yep. 60. Yeah. <laughs> to me, you know, I used to have an office in London, and I spent a lot of time in London, and any time I was there for three or four days and it didn't rain, it was like the greatest. It's Absolutely. still one of my the greatest <laughs> cities ever. We it's, had a great Olympics. Yes, you, you did an amazing <laughs> job with the Olympics. Hey, so my first question, please introduce yourself and tell our listeners about your role at Oxford University and the Oxford Institute of Biomedical Engineering. Okay, so I'm the chair of electrical engineering, been the chair of electrical engineering for the last 15 years, and I've been interested in monitoring what we call safety critical systems. So I've worked a lot with jet engines, okay. Rolls Royce, um, the engine that is going on the Boeing Dreamliner, so which is the Trent 1000, uh-huh. for example, involved in uh, designing the engine health monitoring systems. I've done a lot of. Um, patient monitoring in hospital, right? and I've been in the kind of uh, chronic disease M health space in the last five years or so. Um, during that time, we've set up the Institute of Biomedical Engineering, and it's very interesting. I think similar to a lot of institutes maybe on U.S. campuses, it's actually a bunch of engineers, 200 of us, on the medical campus. So we spend more time with physicians wow. than we do with engineers, which is very important. Wow. That's, so, so with that role, you obviously see a lot of exciting and new initiatives you know, what are some of the new ones coming out of Oxford, especially in the M Health space? Well, we, we, one of the reasons for working with clinicians, and I think it's a requirement the world over, but it is especially acute in the UK, is clinical trial evidence. Right. I think you talked with your previous speaker about yep. how do you convince people. Well, I think you've got two sets of people to convince. 
you've got the physicians uh -huh. and you've got to convince the patients. Now, to convince the physicians, you need clinical trial ev evidence. Uh, now, the highest grade of evidence is the randomized control trial. It can be quite difficult to do in hem health, but we spend a lot of time and energy doing these trials of these new technologies because to us, that's the way that we're going to get the dieting Thomases on board. I, I think that's me. So I'm the C besides being the host of the M Health right. Zone, I'm the CEO of a company called Haptique, and we're yeah. all about cur curating apps, certifying mm -hmm. apps, and prescribing apps. And one of the things that's most interesting to me about the space is there isn't a lot of data out there. Mm -hmm. no, people are creating great technologies. Absolutely. They're creating great devices, great apps, and the bandwidth is here, you know, the whole infrastructure. But no one's really go, or at least I don't see it as much as I, sh I wish I did, going after the data. Where yeah. are the clinical trials? We, common sense wise, we go, if a patient uses this, chances are they're going to adhere to their app, or, you know, to their medication, or they wouldn't adhere to it. If they do this, chances are they're going to be healthier. What do you think one of the reasons why there hasn't been a lot of data collected in this space? Because it's d difficult to do these clinical trials because you're not just doing a drug, placebo versus right. drug. You're doing the technology, not just doing the technology, the way the patient uses it, the way the physician uses it, the whole intervention protocol. Right. It actually takes time and energy, but that's one of our prime drives in Oxford, one of our prime focus. So I've done 18 clinical trials in wow. the last six years of M Health technology. So you have this data. You know what, what works and doesn't work. All right, so we have to talk offline because okay. I'm looking for this data everywhere. And I noticed in 2005, you won the eHealth Innovation Award for Best Device to Empower Patients. So first off, tell us about a, um, the award-winning device. And second, on my side, there was an eHealth Award in 2005. I was under the total impression that mobile health didn't really exist before 2010. Like my iPad didn't mm -hmm. exist before 2009. Mm -hmm. Good point. Maybe slight precursors, and yeah. maybe the first one to win that award. <laughs> um, because you're right, it's when um, a GPRS 3G yep. w was turned on 2002, 2003. And we okay. were precursors of putting uh, technology on a phone, linking it to devices such as a blood sugar meter, via right. Bluetooth, etc. And we were the first people to do that. And I think that's the reason we won the award. We, and But what the thing that it did teach me is that there is another player all of this. It's the patient or the individual, right. and you have to involve them. I'll give you a very simple example, text messages for motivational purposes. Right. So we had text messages for our type 1 diabetes patients about when they should be doing their blood sugar readings and so on. 98% of them came back to us, turn them off. I know I've got diabetes. I know I should be doing my blood sugars. I don't want to be don't reminded remind all the time. That. Leave me alone. I know what I've got to do. Now we're doing a gestational diabetes app. This is women who get uh, diabetes during pregnancy. This is new to them. Uh -huh. They'll get it for about 12 weeks or so. They know that they've got to manage themselves properly for their sake, for the sake of their babies. And, but it's new to them. The more text messages we can send them to remind them what to do when, the happier they are. Because they're hungry for this kind Absolutely. of Absolutely. So you have to understand the individual yep. psychology to empower them. That's right. really the lesson that right. award. Some apps aren't forever. Some apps are disposable apps. It's, you know, it's really interesting you say this. So, what you were doing in 2005, 2006, 2007, there's companies that have raised hundreds of millions of dollars in this ML space who are just trying to do that now. Mm -hmm. So sitting back, do you find it kind of funny that, you know, a diabetes adherence app is popping up and it raised $10, $15 million, and uh, this app... You, you, you could be right. It could be because the data isn't published or, or the, the, the guys who, who are raising the money are not looking in the right journals. There is data out there about how this works. And one of the things which is very clear is that if you put an app out there and right. you have an intervention protocol and it's going to take three to six months to stabilize yep. the patients on, you'll get perfect compliance. The hard thing to do is going beyond the six months. Right. That is really hard. We all seem to be quite easy to motivate to do something right. extra, to do something new even for our health for three to six months. Beyond that, you have to be smart about what you do to keep the the patient, right. the individual involved. Oh, yeah, and, and no, no two patients need are to be, same. are exactly the same. So everyone needs to be done. And then the other side is, hey, if someone does something for 90 or 120 days, do they need an app reminding them every day? A good point, absolutely. I, I mean, I've done all the foods apps, and I, I wear Nike Fuel, and <laughs> I, what I've learned from my, my um, all my sites is that, hey, a shot of tequila has 120 calories, mm -hmm. and after I put that information in five or six times, I remember that. I know, you know, so part is it's changing how you... Yes, but there is a paradox here, which I don't think has been pointed out at the right. conference here, which I think would be very interesting to discuss, is a guy like you who uh -huh. really wants to know about uh -huh. carbohydrates on, you're great and you'll learn and yeah. etc. But in some ways where M Health is going to deliver economic returns For is on the dollar. elderly patients with yep. heart failure, yep. with COPD, with advanced diabetes, etc. Yep. And then the people who don't want to do what you're doing. Right. 
So there's this real dichotomy. Right. The people like you want to do it, or people like me who know about my fitness and so uh -huh. on, we're fine. But really where you're going to have the economic impact in reducing unscheduled yeah. hospital admissions, etc., are on a sector where it's very, very hard to motivate those people right. to do that kind of thing. Do, do you find, I'm personally speaking, do you find it easier in the UK where there's a single payer, where in the US it's not just the government involved, there's the Etnas, the Signers, the United, there's so many different um, players involved to make change moving into M Health? I think people the world over are the same. Okay. So psychology is the same. There may be some things that's slightly easier to do in the socialized medicine, uh, but really you have to understand an individual psychology. And whether you're in the US yep. or the UK, your psychology, if you've got diabetes and have had it for the last 20 years, it's pretty going to be similar in both countries. Absolutely. All right. I got two more questions for okay. you. You're giving a, um, a, a talk this afternoon, keynote, about delivering improved outcomes for chronic disease patients. Without giving away too much, because I want people mm -hmm. here to see it, but our people at home, how can you do this, and how is mHealth Technologies helping you? Well, it's, a, it's the hockey stick we're talking about. Beyond six months, we yep. have to try and be smart. We have to understand the patient's physiology. We have to understand the patient's psychology. So what we're trying to do is, for example, we call episodic monitoring. Minimal background monitoring with occasionally when our software detects some subtle changes, asking them to do a bit more. So, you know, you've got some apps where it would take five, ten minutes to do this every day. Uh -huh. No way that's going to happen. Right. So very short uh, adaptive diaries, which may have very few questions. If we ask them to do any measurements, do it for a very short period of time. And then this is when the electrical engineers come in. You extract the maximum amount of information out of that 30-second measurement. All the patch, I work with a company in the Bay Area, right. Proteus Digital Health, that do patches. Uh -huh. You can stick on for seven days. We do sleep studies. So we do sleep studies. And from the way the sleep patterns are being changed, you can infer a lot about the heart failure patient Absolutely. or the COPD patient. And one final thing. Yeah, tell us. Because our, um, our motto is maximal information at minimal cost to the patient. That's not monetary cost. That's the cost of doing these things right. in your daily timetable. So we have a kind of application we call, we can't call it this because we can't patent the name or trademark that health uh -huh. Skype. Basically, when they are Skyping their grandkids, right. it's a bit like the tricorder. We use the uh -huh. webcam from the uh, tablet or the yep. laptop, and we measure as much as we can. We measure the heart rate, the breathing rate, which other people have done. We're past, we're unique. We've done the oxygen levels as well. This is very cool. I got one more question for sure. you. All right. We wouldn't all be at this conference if we weren't champions in some way, you know, mm -hmm. of wireless health. Let's talk about just really quickly, what do you think the future is? What, what's the biggest change over the next five years? What do you hope the biggest change is going to be in the next five years? Well, I think that the, the, the future is actually demonstrating the long-term monitoring does work. I think the short-term, uh, I think we have the data, the evidence yep. that we were talking about earlier. Long-term, it's about having clever sensors, clever software, and data fusion is very important. Now, it's not just what one sensor tells you. It's the combination yep. of the diary. It's even how long you take to answer the questions uh -huh. in your diary. There may only be two or three questions, but today, because you're not doing so well, the latency time is greater. It means a lot to you, right? Combine that information, combine that with the answer to the diary, combine with these occasional sensor right. measurement, use data fusion, and finally, uh, everybody's different. The algorithms have got to learn right. about each individual, each patient, and wow. then we have robust uh, wireless health, and once it becomes robust and delivers better patient outcomes, then I think everybody will sign up to it. Great. Before I let you go, Lionel, I'll ask every guest I've ever okay. had on the show this. What's your favorite app, and it does not have to be a healthcare app, that you like, that you can't live without these days? Well, um, the, the, the one that I, I personally like is, is about tracking the amount of um, exercise I'm doing each day because we spend far too much time sitting. Which one? My Fitness Pal? What are you into? Which um, is the app? Well, actually, it's one that's developed by a colleague in the university, okay. so it's not um, oh, a commercial one yet. Um, but it also allows me to answer some questions which remind me of what I should really be doing. That's great. Lionel, this was awesome. Thank, Thank you, you for being much. on the yes, show. Thank you for inviting me. Have a me. great rest of the show and a great trip back Thank over you. to Pond. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Wow, that was extremely fascinating. Um, I, my first two guests have blown me away. Um, I can't wait for the next couple guests. Um, I'm going to introduce you now to Mike Chi. Um, he is the founder and CEO of Cognionics. And did I say the name right? That's correct. Thank you. Great. Uh, so, hey, my first question is, first, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Where are you based out of? We're actually based in San Diego. We're oh. not far from here. Uh, probably three or four miles down Miramar Road, so we're very close. All right, so I'm going to ask you the question that I asked him to end with. What's your favorite app? 
<laughs> that's a that's a that's an interesting question. So first of all, uh, fortunately, I'm actually not a big app guy. I'm okay. the type of guy that will download a bunch of apps, right. saw them, forget it, and the next time my iPhone gets wiped and Never it kind of drops. Uh, the my biggest apps that I use every day, Mail and Safari. Okay, see, it. I like read to my hear email. Got to see what I got to see what's going on. I mean, like my one of my favorite apps is Evernote because I like to take notes on it. And my mom loves it. Yeah, it's it's great. Your mom likes Evernote. Yeah, yeah, it's a <laughs> lifesaver for her. I think to me it is the same exact way. All right, first question. Please introduce yourself to our listeners and tell us a little about your company. Sure, um, thank you. So I'm Mike Chi. I am the Chief Technology Officer of Cognionics Inc. Um, it's a UCSD spinoff, um, commercializing <laughs> some of the work I did during P, uh, during my PhD studies right. on uh, dry and non-contact biopotential sensors. We have five employees. We've been in business for a little bit more than a year. All right. What what is a biosensor? So a biopotential sensor is a sensor that senses electric fields in the body, and it's uh, something that everyone actually knows about. So you go to the hospital, you get an electrocardiogram. Uh -huh. That's that's an electric field from the body. It's a biopotential. And um, and what we are trying to do is build better sensors for that. And are the sensors you're building, are they wireless, most of them? Or are they um, wired, or is it a combination? Right. So the sensor is inherently wired, right? You have uh -huh. to have more than one sensor on the body. They have to be wired together in order to sense a voltage. You can't sense a voltage without two leads wired together. Um, however, having said that, our devices are indeed wireless. Right, we're building wearable mobile systems. So wearable, built into my clothing. Wearable that I attach to my body. Um, wearable harnesses. To give you two example, um, we have a ECG monitoring belt. It's okay. kind of like a polar heart strap, but um, we've optimized it to for signal quality for medical purposes rather than a fitness or recreation. Right. That's something you would wear under your clothing or even on top of an undershirt. Um, we're also building EEG headsets to um, to to record brain waves, and that's something you put on sort of like a hat. And all these have, of course, built-in telemetry data storage. So what are some of the key design features of these technologies? And, and how important is how the, the consumer, the patient, the user, do they care what they're going to look like? Uh, do they care what the signal is going to look like? Yeah, what the, what the devices or you know the, the sensors are going to look like. Oh, absolutely. I think yeah. that's, that's a fundamental issue. So um, let me tell you a story. As a, as a sensor guy, one of the traps that we, I've fallen into and I, I've seen I'm, I'm it. only smiling. I love that you called yourself a sensor guy. <laughs> I love that. Uh, that. That's what I am at heart. <laughs> so as a sensor guy, you know, it was easy to get in the trap of I've got a great sensor. It can sense X, Y, Z, everything under the sun. I can produce great demos just walking around yep. with this, with this uh, box with a bunch of leads coming out. Right? But actually, to build a useful product, what you really have to pay attention to is the user experience. Right? If the user experience is not good, you'll never get someone to wear it. Give, uh, for example, for our earliest versions of the ECG system uh -huh. was this really tight vest. Yep. Right? Sure, it didn't require the gels or the adhesives right. that you would, you would you normally have in a hospital, but it was just tight and annoying. And right. to me, I would wear it for two hours. You know, I, that's that's far worse than what you do with a conventional technology. Now, we've been optimizing over the past years, both in, in terms of getting the circuit to perform better right. and, uh, so that we don't need as much pressure and optimizing the shape and form factor to fit different subjects. And now we actually have something that people can wear and walk around. Oh, my. So user experience, I think, is absolutely the key, the most critical thing to getting, to, to getting right if you want a useful product. First, I'm a big believer of passion. I love your passion. It's jumping through. I mean, <laughs> anyone who could get passionate about what they're doing to me is the most amazing thing. You know, funny, I've had a couple conversations, and I've even had on the show um, Sonny Vu from Misfits Wearables. He's very similar in his views. I mean, I don't know. Are you familiar with Misfits? Actually, unfortunately, I'm not. Yeah. You should. Misfit Afterwards, I will make a connection. I'd you and Sonny that. would get along amazing, and he's a San Francisco based guy yeah, as, as well. All right, so here's a question I got Where do you think most people get it wrong when they think about creating wearables? Well, well, first of all, why do you say that? Um, I've seen a lot of very nice uh, wearable systems. For example, I was playing the Fitbit the other day. It's right. very cool. It's a nice so small sensor system. provides a lot of use for it. I'm, I'm a Nike Fuel guy. Yeah, right. Uh, of course. <laughs> uh, so, uh, same, same story for that. So let me ask you, why, why do you feel that um, some wearable systems have not succeeded? Because I, I think, in my opinion, the way they look, the way how big they, they were before as right. they get smaller, right. I, I truly think if you, if you take... Um, like Nike, they've done a really good job creating something that's really stylish. Right. You know, something that you wear around almost as much as art or jewelry as you do as a device. Sort of like, you know, when the first iPod came out, how much cooler it was than a Walkman. It's just how do we, you know, that people aren't going to walk around with a big contraption on right. or something that's going to make them constricted in their day-to-day. -day. At least it's just my opinion looking at it. Right, and I think I think you've pretty much hit, hit the nail on the head. I mean, it's it's about how the device looks, how the 
how the device makes the person right. feel, it, their, their perception of it. Um, you're asking people to do right. a rather drastic behavioral change. Before, you had uh, uh, something a doctor would prescribe, yep. right? They prescribe ECG Holter monitor. It looks stupid. It's bulky. Yep. Well, whatever. Doctor says you have to wear it for 48 yep. hours. You do it. Um, here, I think we're shifting more into something that's self-motivated. Right. You have to get... You have to get the person to really like the device. For example, the uh -huh. iPad is yep. a very well-built device. I actually feel good carrying it around. Yep. And you have to get that experience right. And, and the other side is now, the other, we weren't talking, so we said what it looks like, the data that you can collect. I mean, you couldn't collect this data two or three years ago. So it, it's amazing, just a few sensors in something I wear, you can collect amazing data? Um, yes, yeah, so actually, that's a, great, that's a great comment. So um, at least in my field, the sensors were there a couple years ago, but right. the signals they were producing weren't uh, weren't all that great, and uh, it had, was a combination of problems of uh, both electronics, the the form factor design, and um, the signals weren't good. So even though you could collect the data, it had didn't have very much value to physicians, and certainly um, the signals we collect just having the consumer or the patient look at the raw data, it's right. of very little value. So ha getting to the point where you can actually collect clinical grade data that's comparable to what you would expect to see in the hospital, that's, that's key. Well, you know, so here's something that blows me away. I want you to tell me about it. Your company was chosen by, by NASA to develop a version of your non-contact sensor suit for astronauts' cardiac monitoring. Right. All right, first, bravo. I'm, oh, thank I'm, you. As a, as a fellow geek, I'm just blown away that your organization was selected by NASA. Well, First, we, how'd you feel when they selected you? We were and then extremely tell us honored. That was great. Um, so this was back when our company was launched, and we were looking for, uh, for you know, grant and contract uh -huh. opportunities. I wrote a, uh, it was an uh, SBIR, Small Business Innovation Grant, and um, and we wrote a very nice proposal. We got it funded. It was a huge honor to actually work with NASA, and uh, they, 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 they've been very interested in wearable monitoring systems as well, because when they send these guys right. up, especially for the future missions where, you know, they're trying to go to Mars, right. got people for one or two years um, in, in space, you have to get good health information. Um, so that was a great honor. And then the second part, you asked me how it's, um, how it's relevant to, right. to us. Well, I mean, it's absolutely relevant because people in space work the same as people at home. Um, if you build a system that can, um, that can monitor astronauts very well, right. that's, uh, that's directly translatable to, to, to people on Earth. Now, having said that, um, what the NASA project was, it got our core technology to a better state. Um, because of that research opportunity, right. but um, but to get it working on Earth, we have to refine that even further because with what I call the compliance issue. So right. an astronaut is motivated to wear it; they're yeah. being well. ordered to do so, and of course they want to keep their health uh -huh. uh, health tip, uh, tip top while they're in mission. But to to get p to motivate people to wear it on Earth, you have to you know do all the things we talked about earlier. Right. You got to add an element of cool factor exactly. to it, more than just saying wear this or you're going to get sick or exactly. wear this or we that, can't monitor. That monitoring. doesn't work, right? You it, tell people you can't no. smoke or you get sick. I mean, it, it, well, you, well, you, you know, it's amazing. I, we, with my job at Haptique, we work with a lot of hospitals. Right. And what I keep on hearing is that um, transplant patients have the worst adherence out of anyone. No kidding. And you and I, as common sense, would say, right. go, you give me a new kidney? And you say take this drug take care of it. forever, right? <laughs> but, you know, when you feel better four months later right. and you, you're still a little dizzy from taking the medicine, you stop adhering right. and then your kidney fails. You're right. It's, so it's you, we've got to change perspective. You know how right, people right. how people deal. All right. So my last couple questions. You are the chair uh, of a panel later this week, right? Which discusses emerging technologies in wireless health. So tell our listeners about some of them. Anything you particularly think is really cool? Um, absolutely. So I was first of all, it was a great honor to be a chair of a session. Um, so I was really enthusiastic about one of the talks here. They're, they're all great. Uh, but the one that stood out to me as a, as a sensor, as a uh -huh. circuits guy at heart, was, uh, was the talk about implantable um, chip designs. So what I would consider are... Implantable. Yes. Implantable in my body? Exactly. So computer chips that you can implant in your body have, uh, have built-in radio, have energy harvesting sensors, do the whole shebang um, under the skin or on the skin. So what I would consider that is that that opens up so many new possibilities that we haven't considered before. So the sensors I'm building, right, they open up new opportunities in relatively well-established fields. They, they, they're already there. The use cases are there. We're making it much better. This opens up a whole, a whole, a whole bunch of new opportunities, and I'm just excited to see where, where that's going to head. So where do you – if you had to make a couple of predictions, five years from now, what, what's going to be part of every day? Five years from now, um, I think um, a lot of the, the work we're ta that's being uh, talked about at this conference is going to actually be practical. So the idea of you know, ubiquitous, uh, continuous monitoring, I think the systems will actually get to the point where people can wear them. Right. And I think the infrastructure will evolve to the point where you can actually collect data and, and get that analyzed. So that, that's going to be a key thing. Now, the implantable stuff, I think five years may be a little bit too aggressive, but maybe 10, 15 years down the ro road, I think 
the, the wearables will probably shift to more implants. So right. less, uh, less intervention on the, on the part of the user, uh, better, better compliance, more data. It's always a great thing. So, so, so back at the lab, you guys are dreaming up next generation of sensors right, every right. day? Um, no, <laughs> no. Uh, fortunately, I wish we could uh, dream of new sensors every day, more like every few months. That's but right. uh, we're, we're keeping our heads down, working, uh, working on optimizing the systems we have towards, uh, towards a useful product. All right. I, I don't know you very well. Just met you for the first time. I, I, I felt your passion from the moment you came. I think you're going to be one of the guys who are going to make a difference. And, oh, thank um, you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank and, you. And good luck, Mike. Thank you. It was an honor. Great. And, and as we wait for our next guest to arrive, I just wanted to bring up one news story that I thought was pretty amazing. You know, um, it came from PSFK, and anyone who's been listening to the M Health Zone knows over the years, I'm a huge, huge fan of Popular Science um, Newsletter. There's a watch that monitors bodily stress um, to help calm users down. So it does real, it's called Bandu. You should check it out. And one of the coolest things that it does is if it sees your heart rate going up, it might start playing a song that will relax you. It might send you a message to call your mom. You should check it out. It's in today's um, PSFK magazine um, online, and, or just look up B-A-N-D-U. I think it sounds pretty cool. I'd love to hear what you guys think about it. And at this time, I'd like to introduce my next guest, Dr. Bill Riley. He's the Chief of Science um, and Research and Technology Branch of the Nan National Cancer Institute. Um, Bill? It's an honor to have you on Thank the show. Thank you so much. To, uh, happy to be here. Where are you based out of? Uh, Washington, D.C., Bethesda, okay. Maryland. Great. Yeah. I'm, I'm a graduate of Uni University of Maryland. Well, wonderful. So, so I am a Terp. I actually met my wife there. All right, Bill, I ask everyone this question before they go on. Sure. Favorite app. It does not have to be a healthcare app. It could be just anything that you can't live without these days. <laughs> Favorite app? Uh... Believe it or not, probably Shazam. Okay. Uh, All right. Well, See, I like Shazam. You know, yeah. You know, it's just something nice because I, I can never remember songs, songs. anymore. You know, especially the one from the 60s and 70s where I came along. So, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm yeah. a big fan. There's another site pretty similar, not exactly, called Songs that it does uh, a lot of the same things. I like that. Hey, my first question, please sure. introduce yourself and tell our listeners about your role at the Nan National Cancer Institute. Sure, sure. So, um, so I'm the chief of the Science of Research and Technology branch at wow. NCI. Um, so our role is mostly in cancer prevention and control. How do we do the research better and ways to advance how we do the research better? Um, so new methodologies, new analytics, um, but related to, to the wireless um, health effort, it's on new technologies, uh, new sensor technologies, um, new intervention technologies, those sorts of things, ways that we can kind of change behavior, ways we can assess behavior, assess health status um, better than we've done in the past. Will, will M Health Solutions be coming out of NCI? Yes, yes. Um, more so, you know, NCI, like most of the National Institutes of Health, um, it's, it primarily provides money to universities and academicians to do that work. Um, so we don't so much, we, we have some work that we do internally, right. but a lot of it is work that we fund that um, actually comes from the universities. To do so that any really cool stuff that you see coming? Uh, there is a lot of cool stuff I see coming. Um, Anything you can share with us? Well, yeah, yeah, sure. And, and actually, I'd point everybody. There's a, um, one, one site where you can go to, NIH Reporter um, is a site that lists all the grants that we currently award across right. the country. Um, so it's a great place for people to go and say, you know, so what's NCI funding or what's the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute funding, any of those other places. So um, a lot of nice sort of work that's going on in that area. Um, I think one of the places that we're seeing uh, a lot of work being done now is, that's interesting to me at least, is in sensor technologies from the individual level up to the right. environmental level and integrating those pieces of data together better than we've done before. I think that's, it's, it's a really, career, uh, really cool. So throughout your career, you've done a lot of research um, in the M Health space. Yeah. So tell my listeners a little about that research and some of your findings. Sure. So um, I, I started in this area before there were smartphones. Okay. Um, so it was a. So it wasn't really M Health. But no, it wasn't really, really health. But it was. While we did mobile, while we did mobile technologies. We did special purpose devices. We had. What, what, what's, what is a, purpo a special purpose oh, so device? We, we had like little devices that back when I was in the R and D world that we built that would do um, prompting of uh, smoking behavior, for instance, and monitoring smoking behavior or dietary intake. Um, back in the days of PDAs yeah. and that sort of thing. So. Um, so that was some of the early work, for sure. I'm smiling here because even, even with one of my last guests that I had on today, you guys have been doing this for so long. Do you chuckle a little about this whole rave, you know, the rave about M Health? You guys were doing it before three years ago, and three years ago M Health didn't exist. And now people get amazed when they create an app and it goes, look, I can 
put down how much food I had or what my glucose is. Yeah. And you guys were doing it before. We were doing it for a long time in a lot of different ways. But, yeah, no, I, I, I do joke with people that I didn't realize I was doing mobile health research back when I was doing, quote, mobile health research. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's really sort of an a interesting area. And, I, you know, the thing that I've struggled with, you're talking about interesting findings. Like most researchers, right. I've probably had more negative and modest findings than I actually had these great, wonderful findings, like, right. like most people. And I think part of it is that the one thing we really haven't tackled very well is engagement of people oh, yeah. with the technology, Agreed. right? Agreed. Both initially and then, and especially like for chronic disease entities, uh -huh. we, you know, they have to engage with the technology for a long period of yep. time. How do we keep them engaged? How do we keep them interested in the work as it's going on? How do we keep it so it's novel to them? Um, that's a big one for us to tackle. Right. And and no two people is one app, it's not one app fits all, you know, it's no. not one size fits all. You have to figure out who the audience is and how they, and also when you think about something like cancer, it's all different ages. It doesn't just affect one Absolutely. type of type of person. Right. So, you know, what particularly makes cancer such, you know, treatment ripe for wireless? Well, you know, especially, you know, the treatments have pretty much been the same, right? We do right. chemo and radiation and surgery, and that's kind of for treatment related issues. So people are doing more work in mobile and wireless work now in palliative care, um, end of life, sort of right. shared decision support issues, that kind of thing. Most of the work in mobile health that's really ripe for cancer, and this is true for mm -hmm. heart disease and that sort of thing as well, has been in the prevention area um, and doing all the things we need to do to help people live healthier, live better, and l decrease the likelihood that they're going to develop cancer or heart disease or those sorts of right. things. And, and it is one of those diseases when you get it, it affects you and it's, it's, it's about the individual, but family members have lots and lots of questions Absolutely. And, and your and your life is going to change so any tools you can have to help this transition is are going to be amazing exactly yeah right so how do you think you know mobile health will change the future of, of healthcare and let's use first how do you think it's going to change the treatment of cancer well you know i think you know one of the things that we're going to see more and more is people um, using these technologies to help them um, prevent cancer uh, you know, at the early stages of it. So I think right. one of the things we're going to see more and more of is, is use of these tools to help people sort of own their own health. Yep. Um, we'll, we'll eventually get them to own their own health record too, but at least for yep. right now, we can get them to own their own health, right, and their, and their own way of sort of making sure that they do the things they need to do that will decrease the likelihood of developing cancer and heart disease and those sorts of things. Great. So. And you're, you're on a panel um, discussing evidence you, um, you know, evidence, um, you moderated one on government initiatives and opportunities. What can you tell our listeners about the role of mobile health technology in helping change public health landscape? Well, you know, I, th I think it's having an amazing impact already, um, and and we'll continue on to do more and more as we move. I mean, I think the, the it's, it's just amazing to me, again, sort of coming from a perspective where I had to give out devices uh -huh. in the early days that people actually have well, the devices, yeah. right? And they're not letting go of these and devices. And they're not letting go right? of these devices, and we can use them, and we can use them in their everyday life, and we can intervene, we can be intrusive right. with these devices and, and with their applications where we couldn't before. Um, I, th I just think that's a, a major change. And be able to, like you were saying earlier, right. be able to adapt to people, right. tailor to what they need at the time and those sorts of things. We've, we haven't been able to do that before, and the mobile and wireless space allows us to do I mean, that. That's exciting. It really is very exciting. So, yeah. so for our audience watch, so my audience, you know, we have about ten to 15,000 people listen every week, and about a third of them are developers, about a third of them are what people work in hospitals, and about a third of them mm. are sort of like we'll call it the doc community. Right. So people are always coming up with ideas for apps. I mean – can they go to NCI? I mean, are you open to – how does the outside engage with a, a big organization like yours? Right. Well, so, you know, we, we still do the traditional sort of grant funding okay. process, and, and people can go through that. And, and I think for your audience, especially since a lot of them aren't kind of savvy in uh -huh. the grant world of, of NCI or NIH – um, they can always call a program director like me or someone else and say, you know, this. Is, what do you think? Right. I mean, is this even in the ballpark? And we can kind of guide them through one of the mechanisms that makes sense for a grant, and if not, who they could collaborate with who could do that work with them. Are you having fun? I'm having a great time. This is a great – I mean, you know, it's just an amazing time to be in this space. How much different is your job now than it was two, three, four years ago? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's just changed dramatically. I mean, I just – I, I told people at this meeting already, I, I'm, I'm at more meetings than I know what to do with right now. Yes. And in part, it's because of the excitement about this field and, and, the, and the work that people are able to do and the promise that they see for it moving forward. It was an honor, Bill, having oh, you on, on the show. Thanks and um, so much. I'm a big fan of everything you guys are doing. And um, thank you very much. Thanks. Well,
Well, you know, now it's it's time for my my next guest. My next guest is um, Richard Sergey, Senior Vice President of Media and Development and Strategy at ShareCare.com. Uh, I am a, personally a big fan of, of, of ShareCare and what they're doing. Hey, Richard, welcome to the show. How are you today? Thank you for having me. And I know this is not the most fun for you because um, being on the other side, as a producer, um, you know, anytime the tables are turned, it's awful. I hate when I'm on that side of the microphone, and I like when I'm on this side of the microphone. Um, so can I ask the question? You could ask anything you want. I would love that. We could trade places. Um, hey, so introduce your, yourself to the audience and tell us a little bit about your background. I read your bio. I don't want to give anything away. And then I wanted you to tie in. So how does a guy with a background like that get into something like healthcare? Um, I'm a veteran ex-ABC News journalist of 20 years. Emmy Award years. winner, I might say. Thank you very much. Uh, and spent my career doing a variety of different things, but essentially working for World News Tonight with Peter Jennings and Charlie Gibson and Diane Sawyer and covered the world of technology in my last 15 years, a lot of it being in the medical tech arena. Um, and I was lucky enough to bump into Jeff Arnold, who was the uh, founder and creator of ShareCare and also the founder of WebMD. So um, he, uh, he's had a good track record. He's had a good track record. He stuck me on a project at Discovery that was called Curiosity, which was the precursor of what I've been doing for Jeff, essentially, which is putting together a luminary type list of uh, people across disciplines from art through zoology at Discovery. And I went off and interviewed people from Richard Branson to Ellie Wiesel to Martha so Stewart. Cool. So here at ShareCare, I'm, uh, I put together a list called what we call the Health Makers 250, okay. essentially a group of some of the most thought-provoking people, not all, obviously, within the uh, health community. So we've interviewed people like Mehmet Oz, Deepak Chopra, Andrew Weil, uh, David Agus, Leslie Saxon, all well-known yes. names who are contributing in fascinating ways to the health and wellness debate. How would you come up with 250? It's a nice round, even number. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, you always wonder, how do you, 100, 175, 200, 250? Yeah, we're but actually working on a list of over 1,000, but uh, we call it uh, for uh, safety's sake, 250, and we hope to get to that within about a year. And the interviews, how long are these interviews? These interviews last between 45 minutes and an hour. They're pretty intense. They're all on camera. Right. And they're fairly high level. They're to elicit a sense of uh, what's wrong with healthcare today and how do we fix it. And where will people be able to watch this? Where will they be able to see it? You can go to sharecare.com right now. So you're not waiting until off 250 or no, down to no, post? No, no, okay. no. They're, they're, right, they're on the site now. So given all the people you've been interviewing, what are some of the biggest challenges that you see today in healthcare? Well, I think it's, uh, it's a system that we all know is broken, that isn't right. working very well, that is uh, overtaxed. Uh, physicians don't have enough time to spend with their patients. The technology is changing so rapidly. Uh, how do you keep up? And the costs are just astounding. Um, and I'm sure you've heard yep. from uh, other this, others that you've interviewed that it's a system that is just overwhelmed. So, so you know, what are some of the common threads that you, from most of the people you've interviewed so far, is there something common between all these people and these health innovators? I think there's a sense that people have to take responsibility for their own physical well-being. You so know? it's not just the it's not just the organizations, not just the government. Individuals have to sort of... I think, right, and we're moving toward what you well know is called personalized medicine. Yep. Um, and technology, and you've been talking a lot about it today, sensors that help uh, keep all the real-time data about a person that uh, in the past we just didn't, I mean, for example, a physician said to me, how can you take someone's temperature at 1 p.m. and say that's the mean when uh, at 7 p.m. it's going to be fundamentally different? So if we're equipped with better technology and the sensor technology is getting so sophisticated, um, you'll be able to get better data that will help keep you well. Are there some common themes that are emerging from this project? Um, that everyone needs to lean forward, whether it be the physician or whether it be uh, a health and wellness provider or whether it be uh, the patient themselves. There's a sense that everyone has a stake in uh, making health and wellness better, right. uh, and you just can't leave it to your doctor to make a decision for you. Wow. Any surprises? Did you you um, come across in these you know, interviews? No, I think the surprises are 
um, maybe perhaps some of the obvious ones, the passion with which these health makers, um, Andrew Wall, Mehmet Oz, right. Deepak Chopra, bring to the table the deepness of their, one, curiosity uh, about the issues, and two, how to solve it, how to make the system work better right. for everyone. And the people you're interviewing, the 250, they're not all docs. Right? It's across the board. They're, they're, they're main, developers, technologists, or is it mostly They're mainly physicians, physicians okay. but we are getting to uh, uh, engineers and technologists. And, uh, I mean, for example, a person like Deepak Chopra yep. crosses a All lot of, of different yes. fields. Uh, so whether you want to talk to him about consciousness or whether you want to talk to him about Eastern versus Western medicine, um, you know, you have folks like that within health. When do you expect the project to be over? It's not. It's, it's an ongoing. I mean, as long as Jeff Arnold hires me, uh, this project will continue on. <laughs> All right. So you've covered the technology arena as a journalist and as a producer. You have been involved in healthcare from, you know, the time. Now, what's your impression of the development of mobile health and wireless technology as used in health in healthcare today? And where do you think the most impact is happening? Well, I think it's critical. I mean, we're, we are at an inflection point where I remember going back to the MIT Media Lab, which right. did a uh, heck of a lot of work on wireless technology and body monitoring. In yep. fact, they sent one of the first teams to Mount Everest to monitor a whole team climbing the mountain. I think the breakthrough in uh, cheaper, faster, uh, uh, and implantable is clearly going to be the future of where we're going. Uh, and it seems to me being able to monitor in real time is going to be critically. However, uh, what we haven't talked about, and I'm sure you, you will with, with lots of your guests, are the privacy issues, yep. uh, which are critical. How is this managed yep. with uh, you know tens of millions well. of people having sensors on them? And, and this whole liquid data, where is it going? Who's going to be in control of it? That's like the unanswered questions. Right, and what do insurance companies do with data that may be up in the cloud and accessible? Well, and, and a lot of patients are worried about that data. If my insurance company knows something about me or if my employer knows something about me, is that going to affect my job? Is it going to affect my health care? And the other interesting question is um, what do you do with all this data? I mean, do you want to know? And I hear that from people I interview constantly. Do I really want to know? Uh, that I'm going, I'm a good candidate for early Alzheimer's. Uh, the docs would tell you, yeah, you do want to know. Uh, there's not much we can do about right. it at this point, but in the future, hopefully we can. Well, I know personally I, I don't want to know okay. if, if that's happening. <laughs> hey, I want to thank you for being on the show. Thank good you. luck with the program, and um, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, so, ladies and gentlemen, we have one special last guest um, to add to the show because we're having such a great time. Come on over. So this is another great part about being live at a conference. Someone walks in, and you go, hey, why don't I interview you? So, Donna, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and um, tell us what organization you're with and say hi to the M Health Zone audience. All right. I'm Donna Sprout-Metz. I'm at the University of Southern California. I'm an associate professor in the School of Preventive Medicine. So what is the School of Preventive Medicine? Well, we're trying to prevent medicine, right? Right. So <laughs> where, where, does, where does M Health, where does technology play? Okay, so M Health is, my, my research is very, very based in M Health. I right. do mostly pediatric obesity. Um, and what we're trying to do is use mobile technologies to ca tackle a really difficult problem. We haven't been able to get kids more active. We haven't been right. able to change their dietary habits. And mobile health gives you, as one of my kids said, it's like having a doctor in your pocket. Right. You can talk to them anytime. You, you know, if you know what they're doing ubiquitously, you know, we, we have one project where we actually know it, how long kids are sedentary and when they are, and we can beep them and right. say, hey, you've been sedentary for two hours. Do, in, in your research so far, are you finding that this, this segment of an audience, do they want both proactive and reactive, or do they just want you, know, you the organization, reaching out to them, knowing, saying, hey, you should be doing this, or do they have a lot of questions? Do they want to be? So in the paper I'm going to present tomorrow. OK, I don't want to give anything <laughs> away, but. I'm happy to tell you. We'd so love to hear. In, in that particular study, over the space of one day, we exchanged about 40 text messages with these kids, many really? of them. Were prompted by them, prompted not just prompted by, by the organization. Yeah. yeah. So they want to. I mean, people want to use the technology for the most part. Many kids do. I think one of the most important things, I don't know anything about adults. They're very right. confusing. Yeah, well. But um, one of the most important things, I think, is that we have to think about when we're developing M-Health technologies, 
just because everyone uses an iPhone yep. doesn't mean we don't have to tailor it to the, you know, everybody's iPhone looks different. You know, yes. you move in, it's like slippers and a bathrobe. Yep. So these kids that we work with, because we've gone through the, you know, all the process uh -huh. of, you know, from the ground up, a participatory approach, we've developed an interface that they like. And so, so you took yeah. their feedback in the interface because I'm a huge believer that people think. Oh yeah. What's amazing to me in this whole M Health space that we sort of said, people talk to the doctors, they talk to the developers, they talk to scientists, mm -mm. but very seldom does anyone ever talk to the end customer. What do you want? How do you want this information delivered? Yeah, you to got you? to. I mean, just for starters, we st started out asking them what they would be willing to wear. Right. And. I'll tell you, my guess was all wrong. I thought, oh, they're going to want, you know, on the ankle maybe or on the arm. Right. What do they want? They wanted a chest band. Why? Why do you think? Under the clothes. Hidden. Hidden. Yeah. Wow. See, I, I never would have guessed that. I thought yeah. it would be like, I want something cool, kind of hip, something I could show off. But Really surprising. That's, that's really fascinating. Yeah. What other surprises have you learned from dealing with these kids? Well, this isn't so surprising, but the girls won't carry the cell phones all the time. So you can't. So you know, people are moving well, towards My daughter using, never lets her cell phone down, so. Right, but they, they put it down. It's, they not put the it, same, okay. it's not the same as a guy who has it on his it's, body or at puts, all times. Or we so. have pockets to put it in. Right. right. So. so just using a cell phone as a monitor of activity is probably Doesn't not going to work. work. Not. Um, let me see. What other surprising things? Um it was surprising at the time, and then another colleague came out with an article about the same time that we found right. this out, and that is that kids know who you are, yep. and they really don't want you to use their language when you're talking to them. All right, so so no OMGs yeah. in my in my text to OMG, them. OMG, don't use LOL. Uh, the Ken Resnico's group uh, came out with that article not so long ago. Um, another thing that I found really re here's what I found really surprising: social networks, yep. and oh boy, that's so great, and we should be using this. Kids do not want. When it comes to obesity, oh yeah, because they want to keep it. It's it's. They don't want to tell. They don't want their friends to know what they eat, how right. inactive they are. They don't. Right. They don't want to share that. They might share it with their parents. Right. This is Hispanic populations, right. not to forget. Right, right. And is there any fear with them where this data is going? I mean, is there none? None. So uh, what? I mean, I think we've had a couple of presentations today. I, I'm. My other hat is an is an ethicist, ethicist uh -huh. okay. so I've got a background in medical ethics, and I have a blog, uh, right. sometimes blog, looking at ethical aspects of mobile health. I know. I've actually commented That's on your right. blog. It was great, um, a really great comment. But um, this, the our whole getting getting so riled about privacy. I think it is really important, but I think that certainly the kids that I work with are willing to make many many right. trade offs. So, so the way that we think of it and the way that the future people who are using this think of it are, are not the same. Right. It's not the same. I think it's great. So now that some of the kids have been using it, mm -hmm. are they enjoying it? They did do like it. We haven't had a long-term uh -huh. test of it yet. So because um, one of the things, you know, don't let me start get started on this, but I mean the way that we do our research has to change. Right. It has to change dramatically. The way that f research is funded, it has to change dramatically because we can't keep up. So this was an X year project. Okay. By the time it came to the end of this X year project, you know, if they'd given me the money all at once and given me the, you know, mm -hmm. but our technology was so old by the end of the project, you know. Right. So so keeping up, it's we have to. It's a whole new world. We've got to do our research. It's got to be right. more nimble. We've got to be quick and responsive. Did the control group lose weight? So um, you mean the intervention group? Yeah, the intervention. Yeah. Um, no, we didn't, because it was a short intervention, we sure. didn't look for weight l changes, we looked for activity Can't changes, and yes, they increased their activity. And they walked away more educated? So when, when the program ended, did you just leave them cold out there, or what were they doing? Like, what do you think they're going to do? Are they going to take a more active role and ownership in their, in their health? That's what? a really good question. What, um, what we gave them was a taste of their own data. Okay. And... As you may or may not know, those of us who are you know self quantifiers, uh -huh. we're the odd ones out. Yes, Most people are. don't want their own data, but right. you know what I did find with these kids is that if you if you give them some of their own data in the form that they want it, they like it. They really like it. I think that's amazing. Anything else you want to share with the audience about the paper coming out? Um, that they should know. I mean, think about the audience. It's about M Health. People are listening because they're interested in this space. I think anytime there's any studies done, I'm. I love it because mm -hmm. I don't think there's enough. Like I was telling one of the other guests, there's lots of apps coming out and people are coming cool and creating different elements and how we connect, but 
not a lot of people are going out to the end customer and really feeling and seeing what they need. Yeah, one thing that I don't think we're going to get around is that th everybody's got this idea that technology is going to make it easier. Technology is going to make it better, uh -huh. but it, don't know that it's going to make it any easier. So uh -huh. what we found with, with these kids, we th the, this project, one of the end, end uh, goals was going to be to automate the messages right. for these kids. There's no magic pill. There's no, you know, to personalize those Maybe if you have a huge database uh -huh. of messages, maybe with decision nodes and stuff, but the kids really like having a minder and having somebody that they, a human being that was at the end of the rope there. All right, I, I'm off, off camera in another day. I am going to um, pick your brain because with our role at Haptique, we're getting more and more involved in, in studies. Organizations are coming to us, and anytime it could be something that helps kids. I mean, we'd love to get involved, so I'd love to talk to you more about that. But before yeah, I let you go, I'm going to ask you one last question. I sure. asked everyone this. Okay. Favorite app. It does not have to be a healthcare app. Favorite app today that you think the audience would, be, would, would need. I've heard everything from music apps today to data collection apps today, note-taking apps. What, what is your favorite app these days? Can I have two? You can have three. <laughs> I really like uh, my library app that okay. scans books in so that I know what I've read and I can remember. Oh, that's good. <laughs> it's not health. And the other th thing that I just, I love the Withings and the Withings app. Do you? I think it's great. Blood pressure cuff and scale? Have you played with both of them or what have you played with? I just with? like the scale. The scale? Yeah, I, I, I don't have blood pressure issues yet. So it's good. <laughs> yeah. And let's hope you never do. Donna, right. thank you for being on the show. My this pleasure. was awesome. I can't wait to talk to you offline. Um, and for our entire audience, thanks for tuning in. Um, tomorrow's show is live at the Wireless Health 2012, again tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern or 8 a.m. Pacific. Yes, it's nice and early here. I have Dr. Molly Coy, Chief Innovation Officer at UCLA Health Systems. Robert McRae, President and CEO of WLSA, the guy putting on this conference, Awesome interview. Um, Kane, um, CEO of Independa, you're going to want to hear about this, about home health monitoring for seniors. And Dr. Um, John Matheson, um, Chief Medical Information Officer at Kaiser. So it's going to be an amazing show. I want to thank everyone. I want to thank Miriam and Sarah back in New York for producing the show. And for Nick, our on-site not only producer, cameraman, but all-in-one great guy. And from everyone here in San Diego, thank you for tuning in to the Health Zone, and have a great day.